Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next in our series of candidate panels. My name is Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. All of these panels have been a cooperative effort among the five regional chambers across our region. And they are, of course, the Peninsula Chamber, the West Shore Chamber, the Soup Chamber, the Esquimalt Chamber, and the Greater Victoria Chamber. In fact, my friend, longtime friend, Julie Lawler, is here from the West Shore Chamber. She's going to roll on over and say a few words, and then we're going to introduce our panelists for you for today. So, Julie, come on over. Bruce, we are, as you can see, following physical distancing, so I'm not going to get too close. Um, but, Bruce, if it's okay with you, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people, um, particularly the Esquimalt and the Songhees and the Chiamu Nation. So we are grateful to be able to bring this to you today on these territories. And yes, just as Bruce said, it is our pleasure to be able to collaborate uh, together to bring you these events, especially when we don't have a lot of time. So please engage, glad to have you here and uh, best of luck to the candidates with uh, the rest of the event and your campaigns. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. She's gonna roll out and I'm gonna roll in and take this off and I'm gonna plug my headset in. So we're gonna have a good time here today because we're gonna have a whole series of questions with our candidates. I'd like to introduce them to you right now. Uh, first of all, Mitzi Dean is the candidate for the BC NDP. RJ Senko is the candidate for the BC Liberals and Andy McKinnon is the candidate for the BC Greens in this electoral district of Esquimalt, but chosen. So to get things underway, I'm gonna ask each of you to give us a brief introduction, tell us why you're running, tell us why you feel you're the best candidate and a little brief about yourself. And Mitzi Dean, let's begin with you, please. Well, thank you very much. I'm very proud to be speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt, Songhees and Chiano peoples. Thank you, Bruce, for hosting. Thank you to the chamber. And I want to express my appreciation for all the work of the member businesses of the Chamber and all the work that they've been doing in this very difficult time. My name is Mitzi Dean. I live in the Chosen and I have a 10 year old daughter. I was motivated to run in the 2017 election because I was so dismayed by the cuts in services that we experienced under the BC Liberals government. Again and again, I heard from local families who were working hard and struggling to get ahead. My vision for the community is for no one to be left behind. I believe we can all support each other and make sure that we can all reach our potential. I want to continue building on the work of mine and our government's first term. We have three top priorities. Better healthcare for you and your family. Affordability and security in your home and your community. Good jobs and livelihoods in a clean energy future. If re-elected, I commit to continuing my work to build services, support the vulnerable, and stimulate the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi, very much. Uh, next, RJ Senko, candidate for the BC Liberals. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you to the other candidates for being here, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in live and will watch it later. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people. And I live here in Esquimalt and have done so for the past 10 years. I'm first and foremost a father, very proud father, and a community, community advocate. Uh, I currently work as a consultant in uh, government relations and communications after spending uh, 20 plus years as a chief of staff at both uh, Parliament Hill and at the BC legislature. I also do some work in the uh, hospitality and tourism industry here, so I understand full well the effects that COVID has had on our local economy. Uh, I've volunteered within my community as a vice president of the Esquimalt Chamber for three years. I also was uh, chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee in Esquimalt for three terms, and I was one of uh, three community advocates who formed the uh, Township Community Arts Council, which has a mandate to promote Esquimalt through arts and culture, which is very important to me. I think through this pandemic, we've seen that we have failed in so many areas, long-term health care, homelessness, the opioid crisis, and social injustice. All of these things have gotten worse in recent years, not better. I, during the pandemic, I'm living with my daughter who had to return from university because it was closed down. And we're watching the events unfold, uh, both here in Canada and in the States, and learning from my daughter new perspectives that, you know, people with experience can no longer sit by and just trust that our elected officials will do the right thing. 
So I'm running for my daughter and for her generation so we can leave the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, RJ. And our third participant today is the candidate for the BC Green Party, Andy McKinnon. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much to the chamber for inviting us here today for convening this panel. I'm zooming in from the unceded traditional territory of the Skianu First Nation uh, here in Michosan. Um, I am a retired professional forester and professional biologist here in British Columbia. I worked as a forest ecologist for three decades over most of the province involved in uh, writing, research, and education. Um, I am a Michosan councillor and vice chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board um, right now. Um, I have been an advocate for changes in forest management province-wide for several decades now. I first ran for the BC Green Party in the provincial election in the 2017 election. Um, and I was, uh, um, I was uh, somewhat reluctant to join the fray. I'm not a politician by nature, I'm a scientist. Um, however, I recognize that if there are changes that you wanna see happen, that sometimes you have to step up. And I think that the Green Party platform uh, is uh, addresses the needs of our communities and of the province best. And that's why I'm representing the Green Party in this writing. Thank you, Andy, and thank you to all three of you. So we're gonna move now into the question part. I will first of all acknowledge that I, I'm in downtown Victoria right now, but Amanda and I live in View Royal, which means that we too would like to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Lekwungen speaking nations of the Songhees and the Esquimalt. So Esquimalt Machosan, this, this jurisdiction is home to one of the fastest growing areas in this whole region. And traffic is an ongoing problem, which is a time factor. It's time with your family. It's time to and from. There's an environmental impact for that. There's a stress and frustration part to that. So as this growth will continue, one of the solutions that's been put forward uh, is from BC Ferries for a West Shore Ferry service that would go from Royal Bay and Colwood into the center of the city, as well as probably to CFB Esquimalt. Um, BC Ferry CEO Mark Collins says there's a very strong business case for that. Will you, in this campaign and going forward, work to bring that project forward? And let's begin with RJ Senko. Well, thank you. And as I have been uh, knocking on doors and phoning people, which is an interesting experience during a pandemic, but I've been very encouraged by people's reaction on the doorstep, willing to engage. And certainly transportation, the growth in the West Shore, particularly in Colwood is an issue that needs to be addressed. So I very much would support the idea of the ferry service. I would work with the local governments. I'd work with BC Ferries, DND, BC Transit would have to be involved in that as well. And, and private interests to see what we can do to get that running. Years ago, DND used to run a ferry service of their own. So uh, I think that they might be uh, willing to get involved in that. And I think that that's a kind of positive environmental effect as well from removing cars off of our roads. So I'd also work though with the Island Corridor Foundation. I have a 30 year history with the ENN line, having worked on that issue when I was on Parliament Hill. So I very much support that and look forward to hearing what the other candidates have to say. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Uh, next, let's go to Andy McKinnon. Andy. Absolutely. This is a project that makes great social, economic, and environmental sense. And I would certainly support it. Its great champion is my, my friend, Rob Martin, who is the mayor of Colwood, uh, with whom I served on the library board. Um, it's, uh, I, I've lived in Machosan for more than three decades now, and I've seen the population increase happening and, and the increase in, in difficulty in moving people about. We're going to have somewhere between two and three times the population of Machosan living in Royal Bay. And unless we take some steps to have this kind of alternative transportation, we're not going to get any relief. It will move people, but not vehicles to downtown, which is a double benefit. And I think it would probably be moving ahead quite well now if it hadn't been downplayed by the minister in the New Democratic Party government. Uh, so uh, I would certainly champion this project. I think it's a great one. 
Andy McKinnon, thank you very much. Mitzi Dean. Well, thank you. Yes, I have been working with the people who have been investigating this as a possibility. And more work is needed. We need to make sure that our decisions are based on evidence and science and uh, environmental impact as well. And it's important to remember that any discussion of a ferry is only one part of the larger equation of how we move people and goods around. Because even planning a ferry has to take an integrated regional approach because people have to get to and from the terminals. So our solutions toolkit for South Island also includes bus lanes and rapid buses, improvements to travel corridors like Highway 1 and Highway 14, active transportation corridors like the Galloping Goose and the ENN, government offices in the West Shore and the Archives Building, for example. Mobility is a quality of life issue. We have to factor in childcare and schooling, and it's an economic and environmental issue as well. We want to be able to help people work where they live and live where they work. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi. Does anyone have any uh, comments or anything about something that someone else has said here? Any remarks, RJ? Well, yeah, I'd like to ask uh, specifically, it's interesting that you say your government is working on that and you're working on it, uh, but I have to ask, why is your platform devoid of any commitments for transportation on the South Island? And why is your party so silent on the ENN line? Completely silent, no money, no commitments. Well, thank you for your interest in that. Um, and we actually have done a lot of work on transportation in the South Island. We have the South Island transportation strategy. Within that, there are short-term, medium-term and long-term objectives. And so if we're re-elected, then we will be getting into the analysis of that and creating um, tangible plans in relation to that. We know that we need to be getting people and goods moving. We accelerated the bus lanes on South Island. And I have people now telling me that they're saving up to half an hour in their commutes because of the progress that's been made on the Mackenzie interchange. So this is something that I have always given priority to, always spoken to the Premier and the Minister about, and we'll make sure that we give priority to the South Island transportation strategy. Which has no mention of rail or ferry in it. Both rail and ferry are mentioned in there, and uh, they are options that, as I said to begin with, that need more work and need um, more consideration and collaboration. We need to make sure that we've actually got good, solid evidence for what the particular um, project would be and what the benefits would be and what the outcomes would, would be for our community. And so those, those items are in there, and uh, we'll continue considering them. 15 studies and three business cases is not, doesn't require more study for the ENN, demands action. Your government is willing to spend $500 million per kilometer on the Broadway extension and not a cent on the ENN. For that amount of money, we could do the whole line. We held a historic meeting and we brought together all of the stakeholders from along the whole of the ENN railway line. Uh, and, and transport corridor. That was the first time that had ever happened. There might have been lots of other studies done before. None of them had consulted with indigenous communities that were impacted by what development might have happened on the on the ENN corridor. So we've actually taken historic steps and brought in the stakeholders. And it's not it's not a simple matter. There are a lot of different different and difficult, complicated jurisdictional and legal matters to be dealt with. And we need to make sure that we, we need to take the time to make the right decision because it will be a significant investment. And we need to make sure that it has the, the direct impact and positive benefit for people in terms of helping people move, reducing carbon footprint, uh, and making sure that we are directly tackling that congestion that we see. Well, I started on this 30 years ago. Getting well, RJ, the we're going to have to wrap this up, okay? It seems like more than enough time. Uh, Andy, do you want to wade into this at all? Um, simply uh, that on other matters that I've been involved with, with this government and actually the previous government as well, um, there seems to be an awful lot of, I, I understand and appreciate the importance of bringing all the stakeholders together and working with First Nations, um, but there's an awful lot of, uh, planning and talk, and I agree with RJ that that it would really be nice to see some of this moving forward. 
Thanks. Okay, we're going to move along. We've got a number of other topics we want to talk about today. Um, in the midst of the, the whole pandemic and things that we've been talking about, uh, one of the things that's perhaps been overlooked a little bit in the conversation is things like a shortage of performance venues in this jurisdiction in the West Shore. Um, arts and culture, the profile of that, even recreation would fall under that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what supports would be in place for that particular sector. And Mitzi Dean, we'll start with you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, in fact, I've, I've been actively working with a couple of groups in the West Shore who are trying to bring this vision to reality, and I will continue to support them and to advocate for this as well. We know that for every dollar spent on arts and culture, the, the return to the local economy is many times more. I'm a strong supporter of the arts and culture and a live performance hall on the West Shore would be a much, much loved and much used facility. And South Island is already established as a favorite location, for example, for film and TV production. And right now the Netflix 10 episode series Made is shooting on the West Shore. And this production and others are supporting good paying, family supporting jobs and everybody benefits. And then we can all sit back and we can watch and we can spot out some of our, our favorite places like Hatley Castle in the X-Men and the Descendants films. So yes, very supportive. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Mitzi. RJ. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was one of three community advocates that formed the Township Community Arts Council. That is to promote Esquimalt through arts and culture. And there is definitely an economic spin-off to arts and culture. So I'm very supportive of that. I've not just talked about it, I've actually done it within my community. It's interesting to hear uh, the NDP candidate say that she's working vigorously because when I look at Machosen, they have a proposal for the old schoolhouse for a performing arts center, about 250 people. I've been told that they were unsuccessful in getting their MLA to work on that issue and to get any grants for them. So I would be very supportive in working with Machosen, with Colwood and, and the other communities who wanna bring performing arts to the area We've done it in, uh, in Esquimalt, and I'd like to duplicate that in other areas. Thank you. Thanks, RJ. Andy. Um, yeah, arts, arts is important both culturally and economically, as uh, RJ and Mitzi have pointed out. Uh, in Machosen, uh, a couple of years ago, we purchased the old uh, Machosen School for community use, leased most of it to the Machosen Arts and Cultural Community Association at a nominal rent to encourage uh, a lot of the really excellent uh, artists that we have in our community in Machosen. And, and now the Victoria College of Art has leased a good chunk of the rest of the school. Um, looking more broadly in the riding, the Juan de Fuca Performing Arts Center Society has made several presentations to our council in Machosen. We've offered our support to their concept of a performing arts center in the West Shore. And they recently entered into a, a, a letter of agreement with Colwood to build a 350 seat theater uh, near their park and ride on Ocean Boulevard. And they're exploring options on that. So I've, I've worked really to, to encourage that both locally and regionally. I think it's important. Great, thanks Andy. Any other comments from anyone? Remarks, comments? Thanks Bruce. I continue to support uh, many organizations in our, in our communities. Um, and I was working with the mayor and, uh, and the fire chief as well once the school was purchased to try and find access to grants and access for um, tenants to, to you know, make that a community hub and to bring some additional resources and services into the community. So, um, you know, whenever I'm approached by local organizations, I always make the time to sit down and listen to them and uh, find ways to support them as much as I can. Whenever we are advised of a new grant stream, for example, that comes out of the ministry, I make sure that I get that sent out to our local organizations and sent out to municipalities and indigenous communities as well. And my understanding is that you were unsuccessful in getting any grants for me chosen for that. Well, Bruce, I'm sure you understand that um, there can't be political intervention in the bureaucratic process of grant applications. 
And so if I'm asked to write a letter of support, uh, that's what, you know, that's what I've done for um, some of the other projects that have been brought forward across our constituency. And then as is always happening with uh, grant streams, there's a lot of uh, pressure and they're always oversubscribed, especially after we've had 16 years of cutbacks and lack of services and lack of grants for community organizations. So there's a lot of catch up, there's a lot of uh, competition and I do what I can to make sure that we can bring those services and those extra amenities to our community. Actually gaming grants went up every year under the uh, BC Liberal government. And, and our, our government has actually increased granting streams and we've actually made sure that um, we can increase funding in different areas above and beyond gaming grants. This uh, might be a, a good opportunity. I'm sorry, Nancy, I interrupted. I didn't mean to. Yep, go ahead. I was just going to say this might be a good opportunity to point out the importance of uh, parties working together on initiatives um, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, NDP and the Liberals going back and forth on this. Um, I think that uh, some of the best moments uh, over the last three and a half years could have been four years of the NDP government have been moments of working with the BC Greens and sometimes the Liberals as well on things like uh, UNDRIP. Um, and uh, so I look forward to a legislature, however it's constituted the next one, where the parties uh, can work uh, closely together on initiatives of common interest. All right, thank you all. Speaking of working together, um, a lot, many municipalities are going to be under stress right now because of the tax flow or lack of into their operating uh, budgets with deferral of taxes, loss of taxes from property and business, which brings the conversation around to one that's been in play for probably 100 years around here. And that is the idea of the amalgamation of municipalities. How do you and how do your party plan to deal with that? Are you in favor of amalgamation or are you not? RJ, I'll start with you. Uh, well, I lived in uh, Ottawa, in Ontario, when uh, the uh, government of the day forced amalgamation on every area of the province. And uh, I have to say, over time, uh, well, initially, there was lots of negative reaction, but it did work. We have roughly 400,000 people on the South Island, 13 municipal governments, the CRD. Uh, it seems as though we are overgoverned. In 2014, in the local elections, virtually every municipality held a plebiscite to ask their, their residents what they thought about shared services, amalgamation. I think roughly 80 plus percent in just every municipality said, yes, we'd like to do that. There has been no action taken by any local government. Well, Saanich and Victoria did start a process uh, just about a year ago that they've now put on hold. So I'm disappointed that local governments did not follow the, the will of their voters and do something on that. I think we need to work with local governments in order to see where we can go to better at least have shared services of some type. Thanks, RJ. Mitzi. Yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned for local governments and how they're going to be able to continue to serve our communities because of the pandemic. We have included grants in our recovery um, that they can apply for as part of recovery. And we have to recognize that there's a different impact of COVID on different communities. This is not a fair and equal pandemic. And not only in a square mark chosen are there four municipalities, they're all very different. And there are also three First Nations communities. And we also have the military base. So I think that we actually need to be listening to all communities and all residents. We need to hear their views about how to improve collaboration and how to pull together. And it might be that there's a range of options that might be available. The, so the solution might not just be binary, the current situation or one big region. There might be other combinations that people might be interested in. I'm absolutely in support of shared services, integrated planning, integrated transportation planning, integrated climate action, for example. This needs to be achieved with everyone involved with full rights at the table. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Andy, you live municipal government every day. So what's your take on this? Well, certainly, um, before getting to amalgamation, uh, wherever there are opportunities for shared services, uh, I think municipalities embrace them. 
Uh, we look at uh, RCMP servicing uh, for communities in the West Shore. We look at the fire departments uh, in the area, uh, all with their agreements to help each other out. Um, that can happen without amalgamation, I think. Uh, where amalgamation makes sense that municipalities will discuss it, if they have similar visions for their municipalities. I think uh, the fact that we have a community like Machosan, which is very distinctively rural, right up next to Colwood and Langford, gives a bit of diversity to the West Shore. And I think uh, in a situation like that, uh, Certainly, you would not find the numbers that RJ was talking about in favor of amalgamation in Machosan, for example. The numbers from Machosan were not the, the ones that cited there. They're very different. And, and there may be some, uh, as Mitzi put it, some intermediates. There may be, for example, an opportunity for Machosan and East Soup to work more closely together or Langford and Coleman. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Andy. I want to just move into another question before we have any more dialogue around that. So Esquimalt, which is within this electoral district and Victoria, share a police department. Um, they've had some problems with resources and funding and coming to agreements on things. Uh, would you or your party commit to pursuing a regional police force for Greater Victoria? Uh, Mitzi, I'd like to begin with you, please. Well, thank you. I would say thank you uh, to begin with to all of our members who provide protective and safeguarding services across our region. In Esquimalt, but chosen alone, we have Victoria Esquimalt Police, the Military Police, West Shore RCMP, and a special regional unit. And people move around our region. Criminal activities happen in every community. So we need already to have confidence that our forces are working well together, that they're collaborating, that they're sharing information and not duplicating services. And I've seen that from sitting on regional committees around uh, the CRD. Increased cooperation can only help support improved intelligence, crime prevention, good value and great service. And we can't go back to cuts in service like we saw under the Liberals. So a future service model must be driven by the needs and wants of the community. And I would listen to the community, local leaders and board members and their views on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy McKinnon. Yeah, um, I agree with Bitsy. I think that this is a, an issue that should be driven by community need and by community leaders so that if communities see an opportunity to enhance their services and, and coordinate activities that we should uh, move towards that kind of a model. I know uh, Victoria and Esquimalt uh, work closely together um, and in fact it may very well make sense to look at a more regional police force that would include for example Saanich and Oak Bay. Uh, rather than simply a Victoria Squimalt cooperation. Thanks, Andy. Um, RJ. Well, as everyone has acknowledged here, policing is a local issue, and I've spoken with representatives of all four of the municipalities. I know uh, in my conversations uh, with Mayor Rands, I think Mitch Chosen is very happy with the service that they are supplied, and uh, I don't think they we need to address that if if they're happy. However, um, we spoke about the amalgamation of Vic uh, PD with Esquimalt, and there are genuine concerns in Esquimalt regarding the eight and a half million dollars that the township pays, which they equate to about a two million dollar subsidy of policing in Victoria. I know that they have asked the local MLA for assistance on this matter. And when they went to UBCM and talked to uh, the Solicitor General, he said, oh, that's news to me. So, um, you know, I hear the local MLA saying, I want to listen to people and move them forward. Well, Esquimalt has very clearly told them that there's an issue here and there's been a failure to move that up the line. So that is disappointing. And that is something that I would ensure is brought forward, whether I'm in opposition or in government to bring the concerns locally forward. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other uh, remarks anyone would like to make about anything that anyone has said in the last couple of minutes? I have made sure that we've been listening to the concerns of Esquimalt and I have made sure that 
uh, there's been direct access to the ministry and the minister and we'll continue to uh, explore what options are available with the ministry if I'm re-elected. Well, that would be news to the people of Esquimalt because I've heard uh, that that's not been the case and that's unfortunate. Okay, are we done here? Andy, we're good? Okay. I'm good. Okay, well, I want to swing back to uh, the economy now, if I may. We've made some reference already to uh, the planet. And at a time like this, when we are experiencing the pandemic and all that goes along with that, uh, we also have to sometimes optimistically consider opportunity. And one of the opportunities that's being presented is to undertake a more environmentally sustainable economy. Uh, one of these parties has their name right in that plan, the economy. And as I said in all meetings, it's a green economy to keep the skies bluer and the sunshine oranger, orangish. Staying anyway, so shifting into that, uh, it, it, it's it's climate change. It's a lot of things that come together. Biodiversity loss. We do have opportunity here. How will and would your party address those opportunities? And I think I should probably start with Andy. This will keep the skies orangish from California fires in the future. Do Thinking we'll more about the sun, climate. but. Yeah. Um, yeah, the sun. Um, sure, the Green Party is, has uh, called for the province to use uh, the uh, current pandemic crisis as an opportunity to not go back to where we used to be before. It called for a green recovery from COVID-19, following recommendations from the Emergency Economy Task Force and from Clean BC, which the, the Green Party was integrally involved with. Um, we're the, really the only plan, the only party with a plan that will meet our climate commitments while taking full advantage of the economic opportunities that uh, such a recovery uh, requires. Um, uh, so calling for uh, innovation and development of clean industries in BC, providing tools and incentives for reducing GHG emissions, greenhouse gas, and ensuring transition for workers impacted by moving towards renewable energy and a carbon neutral future. In terms of biodiversity loss, I'll talk about that in a future question, I suppose, Bruce. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, Mitzi. Well, there's nothing more important than taking care of the place that we call home, the air, the land, the water that makes British Columbia such a good place to live and work and raise a family. That's why our Clean BC strategy, which was launched in 2018 to tackle climate change, is so critical to the future of our province and our planet. In the coming years, moving forward ambitiously with the next stages of Clean BC is equally as critical. Clean BC is the most ambitious climate action plan in North America, and it was developed with the Green Party here in BC. And Andrew Weaver says it's his political legacy that he's most proud of. And I know for the people listening and watching, everybody wants to do their bit. So we're helping people with buying e-vehicles e and bikes, increasing public vehicle charging stations, protecting more of BC's old growth forests, banning single use plastics. We're also holding industry more accountable and ensuring that they reduce their pollution. And we're supporting innovation as this is an opportunity for change and to accelerate our climate action. Thanks, RJ. Well, it, it was the BC Liberal Party that made British Columbia a world leader in climate action when they introduced their climate action plan and a carbon tax, which the NDP opposed at the time. So it's good to see that they've had a change of heart in that area. Um, when it comes to the environment, I mean, it, it said you need to think globally and act locally. And that's why at the beginning of this, one of our first questions, I said I would be committed to a ferry service, rail service, improved BC transit service to get cars off the road, more environmentally friendly transportation. Also locally in Esquimalt here, they have a plan for uh, gasification, which would not only reduce about 91% of what the township is currently sending to the Heartland landfill, but it also has the potential to create power down the road. So, and it will allow Esquimalt to meet its greenhouse gas emissions almost with that plan alone. So that's the kind of thing we need to champion locally. The MLA needs to get involved, be at the table and make sure that grants that are available provincially and federally come for that project. 
Thanks, RJ. We're getting a little bit of breakup on your video. Could you maybe uh, just stop your video for a second to let the stream catch up and then turn it back on? That might help uh, with that. So as he does that, anybody have any remarks or uh, comments about anything anyone has said in this question? Certainly. Um, okay. Uh, I, I think because I didn't get a chance to talk about biodiversity and, and Mitzi mentioned old growth forests, I think it's uh, important to point out that there hasn't been a single tree, much less a, a hectare of forest protected during the NDP's time in power at a time when we're logging about 10,000 hectares of old growth each year on Vancouver Island, the same amount that was logged under the Liberals. Uh, there has been a moratorium placed for two years on 350,000 hectares of mostly areas that were not scheduled to be logged and a number of areas that actually already have been logged. So there's very little old growth scheduled to be logged in the area that's been deferred for two years. But it's important, to, I think, to recognize that practically on the ground for old growth forests, there is uh, absolutely no difference between the Liberals under Christy Clark and the NDP under John Horgan. Uh, of course, the NDP also promised to introduce endangered species legislation, hasn't, and earlier this year, the Premier said not to expect it anytime soon. So I, I look forward to actually implementing, honestly, the excellent report that was commissioned by the past government and, and perhaps finding a new way to manage old growth forests, but we're not there yet. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Andy. You know, uh, we both share a passion in this area and many of our neighbours and, uh, and friends and people in our community care very passionately about the issue of old growth. And you, and you know that I've spoken to the Minister about this many times. Um, and as, as you rightly uh, mentioned, we commissioned an, an expert panel and that panel has created a report that has recommendations that we will be able to act upon. In the meantime, we were taking actions that we were able to, to make a start on protecting old growth and making that transition. Um, and obviously one of the really important factors here in moving forwards is a partnership with indigenous communities as well. So that has to be an integrated part of our planning as we move forward. And I'm sure that um, it will be beneficial to us to be able to uh, share your expertise as we move forward and implement the recommendations of that report as well. And I understand that the federal government is gonna be bringing in species at risk legislation. And so we want to have a look at uh, legislation that protects biodiversity and is complementary with um, the, uh, the federal legis legislation. So you and I have had lots of conversations on this area and I hope that we can continue to do that. Thanks, Andy. I, uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm hogging this a bit, but it is a green issue. Um, there is an urgency to this as well. So while these negotiations go on with First Nations, we log 10,000 hectares of old growth forest each year. So it'd be good to wrap up some of these negotiations while there's still some old growth forest left to make decisions about. And as for species at risk legislation, people should keep in mind, BC has more threatened and endangered species than any other province. And we're one of two provinces that lacks endangered species legislation along with the province next to us. Points well taken there. Uh, RJ, do you wanna say anything about back this? again, Bruce? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I would just add to that, I think uh, Mary Hill would be a perfect local example uh, in Machosan where there it's uh, basically surplus D and D property and uh, the uh, local Beecher Bay band and the council at Machosan are working very hard on a proposal to purchase that land, have it protected. It's uh, I think about 15% of old growth uh, Douglas fir left on the South Island. So mm -hmm. it's very important to our local issue. And these are the kind of things that we need to work on. We need to make sure we have strong leadership for Esquimalt Machosan that make sure that the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Forests are aware of these issues and that we can protect that area. Okay, thank you all for those points. Uh, we're going to move along to something else here. So there is a day-to-day -day tragedy that's playing out on the streets of this region, mostly focused in the core of the city, but we are seeing the um, outward exhibiting of drug overdoses and drug episodes 
mental health episodes, the crime associated with that, the property crime, the drug dealing, all of that stuff. The chamber takes the stand that all of those issues are rooted in one core problem, and that is that this is a mental health crisis. These are people that are that are in a very bad place. These souls need to be taken care of, but there's something has to be done to deal with this rampant issue of mental health. I'm asking all of you right now to tell me what you as an elected official and what your party would do to deal with the core issue at all of the, at the core of all of this rather, which is mental health. And Mitzi Dean, I'll begin with you. Yes, yes, there are far too many preventable tragedies occurring in our communities these days. Our friends, neighbors and families are suffering. And we need to remember that this didn't happen overnight. We had the decade and a half of service cutbacks and neglect of our communities. Our government will scale up BC's response to the opioid crisis and keep accelerating BC's response across the full continuum of care. That's prevention, harm reduction, safe prescription medications, treatment and recovery. We'll expand treatment beds along with recovery, detox and aftercare facilities across the province. Complex care housing will provide an increased level of, of support and that will include more access to nurses and psychiatrists. We'll continue to fund mental health intervention teams like the six new assertive community treatment teams recently announced. And we'll increase supportive housing to at least 5,000 units um, in our 10 year Homes for BC plan. And that will help to curb existing encampments and prevent new encampments from being created. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, RJ, over to you. Well, it's interesting to hear uh, Ms. Dean talk about encampments because some of her candidates on the Lower Mainland are actually talking about enshrining encampments as a solution. A tent is not a home. We need more solutions than that. And in fact, uh, the Premier did not deny that when he was asked directly about it in the televised debate. So that is really uh, inappropriate action and something that the NDP needs to uh, clarify. I would say that uh, the BC Liberals were the first to actually start buying properties to home houses back in the early 2000s. We gave the NDP the roadmap, they drove the car off the road. Homelessness is worse today than it was when we started buying homes for people back in the early 2000s. Grant uh, McKenzie from our place has said there is more demand for their services today than ever before. So we just had Thanksgiving. I am less thankful for the condition of our society than I was 15 years ago. The NDP has total lack of leadership. We have a premier, we have the finance minister, we have the education minister and the ag minister all representing the South Island, all sitting around the cabinet table. And what do we see? Homeless camps in our parks. That is not leadership. And I'm sorry, but the talking points just don't jive with reality, Mitzi. Okay, Andy, over to you. Um, yeah, homelessness is a, a, an issue that is going to need cooperation from all three, that requires and has seen cooperation from all three levels of government, uh, from municipal and provincial and from federal governments. It's, it's a tricky question. It's been going on for forever in this part of the world. And I think we've been making some good progress on it through the last uh, uh, sitting of government and perhaps even before that. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to have a look at the Green Party platforms for these on our website, bcgreens.ca. Uh, some components of the Green Party plan uh, for mental health, uh, investing to build an affordable and accessible mental health care system where cost isn't a barrier to seeking health and allocating a billion dollars over a four year cycle to seek to address mental health care within the medical services plan with uh, funding provided for a comprehensive suite of initiatives, uh, $200 million per year to invest in facilities to provide mental health care services and community based centers for mental health and rehabilitation. Um, I think things are moving in the right direction and I'm sure the Greens would love to work with uh, one of these other parties in a cooperative fashion. Okay, thank you, Andy. Any remarks or comments from anybody about anything that anyone else said? 
Well, I would just say that, you know, 175 uh, opioid related deaths per month is not acceptable, is not moving in the right direction. The BC Liberals in 2016 declared a provincial health emergency over the opioid crisis, and it's only gotten worse. So we need to take action. We need to treat the root cause, and, and that's what we're committed to do. Well, and, and just to put that in context, uh, opioid overdoses and deaths were increasing from 2012, and there was a provincial um, emergency declared in 2016. In 2019, and, and the deaths continued climbing, uh, we created a separate Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions in 2017, and in 2019, we saw the first reduction in number of deaths by 36%, in fact, and the trend was continuing to go down. Uh, and then COVID hit. We actually have a pathway to hope, which is a 10 year uh, multi-dimensional mental health plan that supports young people, people with established mental health issues, uh, supports people through urgent primary care centers and primary care services, as well as uh, remote and online services, as well as acute uh, intervention. And so we're working to create a whole system that will handle mental health and addictions across the whole of the province. Because when we formed government, there wasn't a comprehensive system. In fact, it had been pretty much dismantled. Okay. Thank you, Andy, anything you'd like to add? No, I'm good. Thank, thank you. I wanna stay with housing now. Um, we have seen a remarkable, a breathtaking rise in, in property values and in the cost of housing, both rental and open market housing. Um, I would like to know what is going to be happening and what your party would do to ensure that neighborhoods somehow become more affordable and that plan is viable for families in our region. Uh, let's begin with RJ. Well, affordability is definitely an issue uh, throughout this, this riding and something that we need to look at. And affordability is, has decreased. So rents have gone up, home prices have gone up despite the NDP's failed attempt at things like a speculation tax, which by the way, we would get rid of, uh, you know, their vacant home tax, which is only penalizing legitimate British Columbians who have vacation properties. That's not the way to increase affordability. And as I said, rents and home prices have both gone up. Uh, but other things like daycare are also part of affordability. That's why we have a realistic plan for $10 a day for families that earn under $65,000 or up to $65,000, and then a stage $20 and $30 proponent. But we need to work with municipalities on the housing front because they are the ones for municipalities to rezone properties for affordable housing. But we need an integrated approach. We need mixed housing. It's not about having affordable housing in one area, it's about mixed use where you have commercial, residential, rent at both market-based and subsidized so that we can bring communities together and not segregate them into us versus them communities. So those are the initiatives, plus many more at bcliberals.com and our platform. Okay, thanks RJ. Uh, Andy. Yeah, uh, you, you can't have livable communities if you have the kind of affordability crisis that we see in the four municipalities within our riding right now. Um, it's a really serious concern. Uh, the BC Greens plan to address uh, the housing affordability issue includes detailed recommendations for expanding the supply of diverse forms of housing and cooperative housing that are available on the market introducing a rental supplement that will close the gap between affordable rent and what renters are actually paying, introduce a means-tested grant that applies to low and moderate income earners who are paying more than 30% of their income in rent, and convening a task force to deal with the rising cost of strata insurance and develop solutions as soon as the BC Financial Services Authority finishes their investigation. So uh, lots of detailed uh, plans, um, evidence-based on uh, bcgreens.ca. Andy, thank you. Mitzi. Yes, affordability is the biggest single issue in our community and housing affordability, especially uh, so many working people just struggling to be able to pay rent or pay for their house. 
We saw 16 years of BC Liberals' tragic failure to address runaway housing prices or build affordable housing when the community most needed it. Esquimalt, for example, is full of renters and young families. Through our speculation and vacancy tax, we've just heard the Liberals would get rid of, we've turned thousands of empty units into new rental homes. The next four years are critical to the success of our 10-year 10 10 Homes for BC plan to build and revitalize affordable homes um, for everybody from students to seniors. We've already built tens of thousands of affordable rental and supportive homes for people, including several projects here in Esquimalt Machosan, housing hundreds of local residents. We're also fixing up BC's existing stock of social housing, freezing rents and introducing an income tested renters bait. We created the largest middle class tax break when we eliminated MSP. We're tackling affordability with affordable childcare and the child opportunity benefit. Thanks. Thanks, Mitzi. Any comments or remarks briefly? Well, I mean, the NDP has promised 114,000 uh, affordable houses. They've delivered about 2,900. Uh, at that rate, it'll take them about 100 years to complete that. That's unacceptable. Um, so I, I would question that. Uh, I mean, affordability is about taking people's needs into concern. The, uh, the renter's rebate that they're talking about, $400 a year is frankly insulting. So we need to have some serious solutions to this, uh, not just uh, some empty promises. We already have underway uh, as, as many, if not more units uh, across the province now than were created in total under the BC Liberals for 16 years. And I personally have been to um, a, a project up in, in Colwood where we, um, it was shovel ready and uh, we've already, it's already finished. We've already opened it and there are families already living there. And there are units there for people who depend on wheelchairs and they're purposefully designed and creating such a fabulous quality of life for that little neighborhood and community up there. It's so great to, to drive by every day and see it and see that people's lives have been changed already in three and a half years. It is, but that was planned prior to your government. And it was done through a, a very good funding formula that BC Housing has, which really has nothing to do with government. Just a couple of quick points here. Um, an important element of affordability is uh, income. And uh, so the, the BC Greens would very much like to see uh, uh, continuing discussions around not just a, a, a higher minimum wage, but a livable wage that would address the other end of affordability in terms of rental or buying housing. And, and the other aspect is I think that we need to begin doing a better job of setting some measurable goals and objectives uh, so that our uh, our criteria are not always the amount of money that we've spent or the number of units we've constructed, but the effect it's had on what we're trying to do in the end, which is affordability. Is that becoming, are things becoming more affordable or are they becoming less affordable? And so the importance of establishing those sorts of clear targets should be more at the forefront of our activities. Okay, thank you all. A very important final question for today. There are, as we've mentioned, three First Nations within this electoral district. Across our region, across the entire region, there are systemic challenges for First Nations and Indigenous people to do things like secure capital or the opportunity to access that to enhance their business, to enhance their transportation, their environmental sustainability, their health, their safety, their education. What would you and your government do to support these people achieving their ultimate and optimum success. Uh, Mitzi, I'd like to start with you, please. Thank you. I want to start with a big thank you to Elder Shirley Alphonse. She's been elder to the Premier and a mentor and a guide to me, and, and she generously shares her wisdom. I'm very proud that our government passed the first legislation in the country to enshrine, enshrine the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it was actually a very emotional event. We were even like lifting our desks up and passing tissues to each other. And this legislation will ensure that as we move forward, we will always partner with and show respect for indigenous communities. It creates that certainty that will create opportunities for investment. Our government has taken historic steps of sharing gaming revenue. Again, that is a, a foundation that means that indigenous communities can borrow against it. 
um, building houses on and off reserve and investing in indigenous language revitalization, for example. And uh, with, there are ways that we're able to support indigenous communities in accessing capital and being able to create their own investment pathway and their own uh, self-determined pathway as well. And as the MLA, I made sure I took the responsibility of connecting appropriately with local indigenous leaders and communities and ensuring that I effectively represented them and their views. Thank you. Thanks, Mitzi. Andy. Well, uh, in my six years as a councillor in the Chosen, we've had an opportunity to uh, to work closely and cooperatively with our friends and neighbours in the, the Beecher Bay or Skiam First Nation um, in a large uh, land swap that was organised during my last term uh, that led to increased green spaces, increased economic and social benefits uh, for the First Nation and a business park for Langford. Uh, we're now working cooperatively with the Beecher Bay First Nation um, on a number of initiatives, including um, the, uh, the acquisition of the uh, Mary Hill property, uh, which uh, RJ mentioned earlier on. Thank you for the shout out, RJ. Um, I, I think that uh, all of our communities prosper when we prosper together. And I think it's critical that we work closely with uh, our friends and our neighbors in this riding uh, with the First Nations. Thanks, Andy. RJ. Well, as everyone has mentioned, we do have a number of uh, reserves and bands within our community. And so reconciliation obviously is an important issue that we need to be serious about. And it's more about, no, it's not about talk, it's about action. It's about realizing the the cultural needs of the communities and recognizing how we can move forward with them. BC Liberals signed the first modern treaties, uh, including with the Malnuth here on the island, giving them economic opportunities that previously they did not have. So I think there are great opportunities to work with the Squamalt, Songhees, Beecher Bay um, on cultural tourism opportunities. I think those are tremendous. Um, that we could build on, work with them. I look at Beecher Bay and the, the Spirit Bay development that they've done there. There's also increasing uh, rental uh, accommodations in Esquimalt that are being built on reserve lands. So those are the kind of things we need to work on with the bands to ensure that they can move forward as an equal part of our society. Thank you. That's such important work, whatever form that takes, it really is. For the sake of time, we're gonna move into our closing remarks now. Uh, we wanna thank you all once again for being here. So each of you will now have up to two minutes to make some final remarks uh, and close it off here. And let's start with RJ Senko, the Liberal candidate. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all the candidates for taking part. I'd like to thank the chambers for putting this on and for the people that uh, are tuning in. So I would just like to say that being a, an MLA is about working for your constituents and for your communities. So when I'm stopped on the streets by parents from a college school who say, our MLA has refused every invitation to visit the school. And when we asked her about replacing the aging facility, she says, it's not our government's priority. Well, if it's constituents priorities, it's the MLA's priority. It's not about what the party wants. When I'm talking to Paul and he says, our local MLA won't help me with my issue around pension reform for older workers. I say, that's the job of an MLA. When the people from Gorge Vale Golf Course say they didn't get any help from the MLA in regards to rezoning for a seniors housing complex in the center of Esquimalt, I say, that's not right. It's about having a local representative who will work for the causes that the people in the area want and deserve. It's not about warming a seat, it's not about voting party lines, and it's not about reciting platform commitments. It's about working for the people, working across party lines to put people before politics. And if I am elected, that's exactly what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you, RJ Senko. Next, Andy McKinnon, BC Green Party candidate. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, thank you to the chamber and, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, thanks to Mitzi and RJ. 
uh, for putting your names forward for this. Um, I uh, don't normally spend a lot of time uh, on a campaign and I had planned to spend more time collecting uh, foraging for wild mushrooms this October rather than being in this totally um, unnecessary campaign. Um, uh, it's, it's frustrating. I know that uh, the Premier explained a number of different reasons for calling the campaign, among them that uh, we were uh, tiresome to, to work with. Um, I think fortunately the editorial writers of the Vancouver Sun Province, Victoria Times Colonist, Prince George Citizen, myself and probably a lot of people in this room saw through that explanation and realized that the NDP saw the opportunity to, to secure a majority government um, and so we're immersed in an election. I think if we somehow deliver to them a majority government, uh, that would be simply rewarding bad behavior and I encourage people not to do so. Um, I'm happy to represent the BC Greens in this writing of Esquimalt Machosen. I, I think we have an innovative evidence-based approach to policy development and I can stand behind the social, environmental, and, and economic policies of the Green Party. I think if you're looking for a party with some different approaches to some of these environmental issues, you'd probably want to consider voting Green. Um, if you're looking for a party that values uh, old growth forests, uh, changes in forest policy, wants to uh, stop massive subsidies to oil and gas, wants to walk away from Site C wants to introduce some endangered species legislation. If any of these issues are important to you, I would encourage you to vote green. Uh, I was the green candidate in 2017. We managed to secure 25% of the vote, quite a large increase from the time before. I honestly believe that uh, Esquimalt Machosen can elect a green MLA with your support. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Andy McKinnon. And the final word goes to BC NDP candidate Mitzi Dean. Mitzi. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Bruce. Thank you to the Chamber. Thank you to everybody who has tuned in today for this discussion or is, is watching it later. Thank you to the other candidates uh, for taking part and having such a, a lively debate. I've been honoured to serve as the MLA for Squimont Machosen for the last three and a half years. This is a really hard working community. It's filled with caring, dedicated, committed people who deserve a government that is looking out for them. And I can tell you, we have served hundreds of people through our constituency office, and we're very happy to continue doing that. I want to say thank you to my staff who deliver such wonderful service across our community. Moving forward, our plan for BC has three top priorities. Better health care for you and your family. Affordability and security in your home and community good jobs and livelihoods in a clean energy future. If I'm re-elected, I commit to continuing my work to build services, support the vulnerable and stimulate the economy. I will continue to advocate for health services and good care in the community, investments in education and support for our school communities, solutions to the local congestion and global climate crisis, family supporting jobs and ensuring equal access for all building on our pathway of reconciliation and ensuring that we sustain livable and affordable communities and neighbourhoods. We face big challenges over the next four years. The question British Columbians need to ask themselves is this, where do they want to go and who do they want to lead them? John Horgan and our team will always keep working for you. Together, we can keep BC moving forward for all of us. Thank you. Nancy Dean, thank you. I just want to wrap up by saying uh, there's some things we didn't get to today. We uh, we had planned on possibly talking about child care and balancing the budget and rent subsidies and the employee health tax, but those things are all uh, available. Policies are on your collective websites, I'm sure, for people to investigate. Thank you to the three of you for taking part in this. Thank you also for stepping up with your candidacy. It's such an important part of our democracy, and we very much appreciate you doing what is sometimes a thankless task. So thank you so much for that. Um, a shout out to the other chambers and their help and their input into this event. The chambers in Souk, in the West Shore, in the Peninsula and in Esquimalt. Thank you to them for their support for the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce and to the remarkable staff here at this chamber who helped put this whole event together. Thank you to all of you. Have a great weekend, vote. Please make sure you vote. And if you have any more questions about this or other events, you're welcome to contact me. My email is ceo 
at victoriachamber.ca. And our final candidate panel will be next Tuesday with the candidates from the Victoria Swan Lake Electoral District. Thank you all once again. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Bruce.